Hello, my name is Andy Klemenko, and I wanted to give everyone a chance to take a look at Docker Enterprise and some of the features that you get. Um, logging into Docker Enterprise, you start off with a dashboard with metrics. This really is meant to be more of a, as an executive overview that allows you to kind of quickly see, do you have any errors going on in the system? What kind of metrics you see for the managers and worker nodes? We can even kind of look at some of the metrics for the last hour, last 30 minutes. But again, really this is kind of meant to be more of a, an overview executive dashboard than it would be to replace your monitoring system. Still rely on, on your internal monitoring systems. A couple of things I wanna highlight here are the fact that out of the box, Universal Control Plane and Docker Trusted Registry, those are components of Docker Enterprise. They come with self-signed cert. We really do believe in the mantra secure by default. Those self-signed certs really do help with that. Uh, you can obviously go into the admin settings and you can replace certificates with officially signed ones at any point in time. Just kind of improving security a little bit, keeping it internal to your organization. A couple of the things I wanna point out here is authentication and authorization. We are fully LDAP AD enabled and SAML enabled. We can use external providers to provide uh, those usernames and passwords. A couple of things here to take a look at in terms of authentication are the fact that I can go into my profile and I can generate what's called a client bundle. So along the same lines in terms of authentication and authorization, these client bundles are X509 certificates. This allows me to use a file on a file system to authenticate for either the CLI or the API. It's very nice, that way I don't have to pass passwords back and forth. These X509 certificates will act as my entry point. Kind of a moving along, as you can see, we've got a lot of options here. When you configure LDAP and AD, you do have the option to create organizations and teams based off of LDAP groups or AD groups. And this gives you a lot of power to, to not have to manage these users independently. However, if you don't want to manage them through LDAP and AD, we do have an internal database that you can use. And I've created a bunch of dummy accounts right here. And with those dummy accounts or LDAP and AD, you can go into roles and grants and you can assign RBAC permissions with a very fine grain control to any user being able to do anything on the system. Notice at the top, both Kubernetes and Swarm. The RBAC for Swarm and Kubernetes is managed independently, and it does actually give you some, some opportunity to have a single pane of glass and provide both Kubernetes and Swarm resources to your end users. Moving along to shared resources, one of the big highlights here is nodes. This shows me all the nodes in my cluster. And notice right now I've got a manager, that's the node I'm talking to. I have a worker in mixed mode, that's my Docker Trusted Registry node. And then I've got a swarm worker node. One of the nice things we can do is we can actually drill into it. We can look at metrics for the node itself. One of the other nice things we can do is go into the edit mode and we can drain it. This, also, this allows us to take nodes offline, maybe do perform, uh, operating system upgrades, whatever maintenance you wanna do on the node. And this tells the orchestrator, whether it's Kubernetes or swarm, to go ahead and move those workloads onto other nodes. And that way the application remains highly available and we can still do node level operations. This also applies for if I want to switch from Swarm or Kubernetes. Again, when, when Docker Enterprise ships out of the box, we provide both Swarm and Kubernetes orchestrators. Here I can say, I want this node specifically to listen to Kubernetes or specifically listen to Swarm. In this case, let's flip it over to Kubernetes and let's hit save. What this will do in the background is it'll evacuate any swarm workloads on that node and it'll make sure the node is clean and ready to go for Kubernetes. Speaking of Kubernetes, we do have some, uh, basically a dashboard that explains all the, the, the namespaces, service accounts, controllers, load balancers. Notice I really don't have a whole lot of uh, deployed here. And actually if we go into namespaces, I've just got the default and we create a kube system and a kube public for deploying Kubernetes. This is where you could view all of your Kubernetes objects. Let me collapse these. Moving on to Swarm, at least from a GUI point of view, similar kind of function where we've got services, volumes, networks, and potentially secrets. Really a high level. 
Uh, one of the things also to point out here at the bottom live API, if you ever need to want to manipulate UCP from the API, we have full swagger and you can actually go, it'll give you the curl command to use and you can actually start to write your own scripts and, and functions on top of our existing platform. So let's go ahead and look at Docker Trusted Registry and then I'll show you how the client bundles work. So moving on to Docker Trusted Registry, this is gonna be your central point. This is gonna be your source of truth for images. Now, whether you're gonna share those images across multiple clusters, whether you're gonna share them enterprise-wide, that's up to you. What I wanna do is highlight a couple of the features here. Uh, a couple of good ones to start off with is UCP and DTR share the same authentication backend. So I don't need to configure LDAP or AD or if I'm using the internal database, I don't need to configure it for Docker Trusted Registry. Again, let's look at the settings real quick. Again, in the settings, um, I can turn on single sign-on, I can disable single sign-on. So this allows me to kind of obfuscate the use of UCP to end users. It also allows me, uh, we've also got proxy settings, we've also got TLS settings, very typical thing here in, in changing the certs. Moving on to storage. Uh, with DTR, we have the ability to use S3 or NFS backends. If you're going into a highly available mode, you're obviously going to want some sort of external storage. And for giggles here, I'm using a min IO container running on port 9000 on the same node as an S3 service. And then I configured DTR to use that. So that'd be a real easy way for me to scale up DTR replicas and just point to that same service and I would effectively have consistent storage. Kind of nice. Moving on to security. Here in the security, we've got the image scanning enabled and we're in an online mode right now, which means that on a regular basis, every couple hours, DTR will go and try and pull down a CVE database from our servers. And the nice thing about that is, is that when we scan the images, we create a hash. And then as we get new databases, we just do a comparator. So that comparator is incredibly quick. And let me show you a, an image that was actually scanned. Let's go to tags. And one thing I want to point out, notice it was promoted. And I'll show you the promotion policy in a minute. But, the, but it was promoted based upon that CVE scan and a threshold we set. So let's actually look at this, the scan itself. The default view is layers view, and notice the layers view looks very similar to a Docker file. This allows you to correlate back to where was this vulnerability introduced into my image. And then if we notice, it didn't come from line one, which is effectively the from. Now I've built this image myself and I know it's based on Alpine, so I know my Alpine base image is good to go. Line six, if we go look at it, we can see that it's doing an APK update, APK add. So I'm adding components to the image. In this case, I have three components that are that have vulnerabilities. And I could click into each component. What I actually like doing is clicking on the components view. Now this gives me a little better view of what's going on in terms of just from the components there. The other nice thing about it is I can click on curl or any one of them and notice I'm getting the CVE list here, the CVE link. This link will take you to MITRE's website and actually allow me to start to cross-reference. Is this a false positive? Is this an actual issue? Well, let's assume this isn't an issue. How would I go and mitigate it? Well, if it's a false positive, I can actually go in to show layers affected and click hide. So notice at the top, it says one critical, one major, and then now it says one critical, one major, one hidden. Why is this valuable? Well, this is valuable because remember I told you about that promotion policy? So that's the target. We can go and actually look at it. And what I'm doing is I'm I'm pushing into a private repo my image. It should be pushed in from a CI system, Jenkins, Tra uh, Jenkins, Circle, GitLab. There's a couple of a dozen different ways to, to push it in from a CI system. It goes into a private repo. It's private only to the CI system and admin. So no user, no developer could pull that image because we want that vulnerability scan. Once we get the scan, the promotion is triggered if it's got less than or equal to 10 critical vulnerabilities. Now, obviously, that threshold's really high, but the nice thing is, is that it allows me to set a threshold per image. 
So from a security standpoint of view, with risk mitigation is I can dial it up, I can dial it down depending on what it's doing, where it's going. And, what, and when this promotes, it's promoting to the admin. In this case, it was promoted to the Flask. Um, yeah, because we're looking at it from the target view versus the source view, so let's go ahead and cancel. And so when we look at the tags, we see it's got that promoted tag. A couple other features we have for uh, DTR is webhooks. I can go and trigger webhooks. So when an action is performed, it can go trigger some other action within a CI system or some other system. Pruning. This is a fun one. This is relatively new. The pruning policy allows me to delete tags based on these criteria. My favorite one is last updated in 90 days. Okay. I love this one from a security standpoint of view because I want to make sure I want to make sure that that we only have the latest images available. In my mind, 90 days is is a is a great number because we should always be building new images, but I can completely understand if that's something like 180 or 360 depending upon your corporate policy. Looking at mirrors, this is another good one. We can set up a mirror. So the way to think about a, a promotion policy is it's it's within the same registry. A mirror allows me to mirror between registries. So here I could say push to a remote registry and it could be another Docker trusted registry or it could be hub. Now we can always reverse this and pull from hub. This gives us a, this gives us the ability to really create a supply chain of multiple registries. My favorite uh, saying is no human should build or deploy code meant for production. And what this will allow me to do is move images in from a CI system into a non-prod environment, scan them for vulnerabilities, and then potentially mirror it to a production cluster. And the production cluster can only pull from its own registry. It gives me a lot of control, which is nice to see. Okay, so that's Docker Trusted Registry at a high level. Let's actually go into the uh, demonstrating the client bundle authentication. Because one of the questions we get is about, well, Docker Enterprise is Swarm. No, it's not just Swarm. It's Swarm and Kubernetes. Uh, and then, then the follow-up question is, what does that look like? Well, it looks like any other Kubernetes. But when we talked about the client bundle, and keep in mind, I got a bunch of files here, the client bundle actually will generate, uh, provide the cert.pem, the key.pem, env.sh, which configures my shell, a kubeyaml, it provides all those pieces I need to authenticate. So let's go ahead and source n.sh. And what it's done right now is it's gone and told my local Docker client, which is running on my Mac, hey, go talk to this cluster over there. So if I do a Docker node ls, now I'll see all the nodes in the cluster and I'm authenticated using my x509 cert and RBAC is still being applied to me. I could even do kubectl get nodes, and I'll see the same thing. I'm talking to, the first command was talking to the Swarm orchestrator. The second command was talking to the Kubernetes uh, orchestrator. So if I wanted to deploy Kubernetes, let's go and deploy Prometheus Grafana. This is a fun one. Kub apply dash f, and I'm doing everything in this directory. So it's the same kubectl commands that you would use on your existing clusters exact same. And when this is done, I will use a fun tool. I don't know if you guys have noticed, uh, found this tool, KNS. It's fantastic. So now I can flip over to the monitoring namespace. And I've got some script through to kind of show me what namespace I'm in. I don't, I don't have the new one with the dash A on it yet. But the nice thing is now I can do a kubectl get ns. So I can see all the namespaces. Kube get svc. And now I can start to see all of my services and the ports. And it really is that simple. And just to prove to y'all, let's do, prom.docker.life, what was the port for Grafana? 34484.
And here we go, logging into the Grafana I just deployed. And here's my cluster health. So it's the same Kubernetes, you get the addition of Swarm, pretty easy, pretty succinct. Uh, in, in a future video, I'm gonna actually show you how to install Docker Enterprise. And it quite literally is six commands. It is that simple. In the meantime, if you guys have any questions, please feel, re feel free to reach out to me at Clemenko at Docker, C-L-E-M-E-N-K-O at Docker. And I'm also on Twitter and the tubes and all that good stuff. Thanks for watching. Bye.